French Renaissance seating really takes on its own form. We're going to see very, very different ideas than what we've seen in the past, and you're going to see some very modern ideas developing. Now, of course, we start with our basic stool or salier, and here we have well, a basic four-legged stool. In some cases, we will actually have what is effectively a four-legged stool with two runners underneath and usually a runner in between uh, those two, or sorry, two stretches underneath and a runner in between them. And this H form is very strong and very uh, functional. These will sometimes be cushioned, but they give rise to another form, which is the tuffet. Now, the tuffet you would call an ottoman today. It is basically a stool that has been covered in fabric so that the feet uh, are typically hidden. And it would have served as a footstool. Of course, chairs at the time are typically very tall, so you need something so that the feet will be comfortable. Otherwise, if your feet are just sort of hanging off, it's not a great experience. Now, one of the more interesting seats that we see, and a multifunction seat that would be really useful in furniture today, would be a form of the banque tournée. Now, this is a bench, and the whole purpose of this bench is that the back flips over. You see that it can rest on one side or be flipped to rest on the other. Why would I ever need to do this? Well, for example, if I'm in a banquet hall with a fire on one side, I can flip it over and use the table and then flip it the other way and face the fireplace without ever having to move the piece of furniture. I'll also point out that there's no storage in this piece of furniture, so uh, it's a little unusual that way as well. It's simply a seating unit and a very effective one. I mean, when you think about it, you could put it between two spaces and then flip it back and forth as needed. Then we have the wainscot chair, and this is based on uh, wainscoting as a decorative form. This typically belongs to really the patriarch of the house. I would say the person in charge of the house, but given that we're in France in the Renaissance, it's probably a uh, patriarch, and it's going to have a highly decorative back. Uh, that is because this is a chair that is going to be a symbol of status. This is sort of a new version of the chair of a state. The bottom uh, actually opens up, so we have storage here, and typically it's going to be some valuable stuff, the sort of thing that you want people uh, to stay away from because, of course, dad is, or whoever is sitting here all the time and so can keep track of those things. Uh, in this case, you see sort of a updated linen fold uh, in the pattern. We're going to see those linen folds continuing through the French Renaissance. Now we'll see the Henry II style, and this is where we start to get into chairs as we know them today. Something that's lightweight, that's movable, that's intended to be moved. And this brings me to this issue. Let's talk about some of the anatomy of a chair. The top is a crest rail. If there's a centerpiece, it's a splat. Uh, we, of course, have the seat rail running underneath the seat. Uh, cabriole legs, which we've kind of dealt with already, or we will deal with, with the knee and ankle. Uh, we have a stretcher underneath. Now, runners typically are underneath the feet, and stretchers are typically in between the legs. So all four of these elements would be stretchers. Occasionally, they, they're flipped around. Uh, when we talk about chairs today, in modern times, the term runner and stretcher get interchanged frequently. Unless you're dealing with a rocking chair, then the rocking elements are called runners. So with that out of the way, let's talk about this Henry II style. And so chairs are becoming lighter weight and more common. They begin to replace benches and stools. After all, it's more effective. You don't need everyone lining up on a bench. Now, the chair backs are going to start to be lowered, uh, as well as the seat. The seat being lowered means we don't need a footstool, and the chair back being lowered may be in part due to hairstyles and other ideas of the time, so that the head isn't constantly touching something. 
Uh, so we're going to see a few changes here. You will see it adjusted to fit the human body and we'll see versions that are made for women to better suit their uh, rather massive skirts of the time. Now, most examples are armless, but sometimes we do see arms as we see here and they are almost always curved. Uh, so it's a style. It's a form, and like all of these early styles, it's pretty easy to sit there and go, is this Henry II? Is this Louis XIII? A lot of that becomes more of an academic discussion. What you would need to know in general is that it is French Renaissance. Then we have uh, the Cacciatore, which is a whole new kind of chair. This is a lightweight chair with a high back and U-shaped arms coming off of it. Uh, the low trapezoidal seat was wider in the front than in the back, making the back legs closer together than the front. The legs are frequently turned, in other words, it's lathe work, and the front legs continue upward to support the arms. A stretcher connects the legs near the floor, and the legs were supported typically by these bun feet, and the bun feet are basically sort of like smashed spheres or buns. Uh, if you were looking at this from the front, it would look something like this, like a curling stone, or I mean, imagine that as, you know, more proper, but uh, that's basically a bun foot. It looks like a hamburger bun, uh, effectively. And it's one of the early foot forms that we see. You'll also notice they don't do that in the back because what's the point? No one's really looking at the back of the chair anyway, at least not the back feet. The back of the chair is frequently going to be well-appointed, decorated in any number of different forms, sometimes borrowing, such as we see here, sort of gothic tracery, uh, sometimes moving more into the grotesque or arabesque form, as we see over here. Almost all of these will have some form of cushion with them, although, of course, that's frequently lost. Uh, these are also frequently made in walnut once again, walnut being a very popular wood during the Renaissance. And then we have a lighter chair. This is a small, unupholstered, armless chair with a rectangular seat and turned legs, generally connected by a stretcher near the floor. And actually, we see four different stretchers there. Now, these are going to be your typical everyday chairs. And this looks a lot like your dining room chair, maybe at home. Uh, and that's where we're getting the idea from. So we have a very simple form. You'll notice there's no carving, uh, no meticulous carving on the back. Everything, all the ornament is done on the lathe. Now, the reason you do that is on higher end pieces, of course, you want to show off the skill of the joiner. You want to show off the skill of the workshop. In this case, you'll notice that that's the only real ornamentation going on. We have a hook at the top, but otherwise we just have those turned spindles at the front. And that's to show off uh, some form of ornamentation in a very inexpensive form. After all, lathe work is pretty quick compared to hand carving, for example, uh, all of the other wooden elements on the chair. So these are sort of the common man's chair. This is where we're starting to see chairs take off in the working class and arguably the poor are going to start getting chairs, but they are fairly expensive. Uh, you'd be paying as much for a chair then as you might pay for a couch down at Steinhoffel's today. And then we have the Louis XIII Os de Mouton, and this is named after lamb bones, uh, which it kind of looks like. It's a stylized form, and the version you're looking at here is actually unupholstered. Uh, you will see chairs like this quite commonly, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, in this case, it's clear upholstery, so you can kind of see what's going on. And what you're seeing is this very interesting form that mimics some of, uh, basically mimics lamb bones specifically mimicking their legs. And so you're seeing that in the arms, this unusual form where it drops down. The arm is very narrow, uh, but rounds off very nicely at the end. As you look down, we see that cambrial leg with a knee, uh, which is up here. That's the part that comes out as it bends back. 
and an ankle, which is right here, bending forward. Imagine this as a lamb's leg. It gives it a very delicate feel. It gives it a very relaxing, curvilinear feel, but it is a stylized chair. So uh, this is a style that would stand out if you saw it today, and you would know that it is a Louis XIII os de Moton.